This is from my podcast, Down to Sleep, where I read books to help you get a good night's rest. You can listen for free here, Spotify, or other apps. Come and support the podcast on Patreon and get a bonus episode every single week, as well as vote on what book I read next. Hit like and subscribe, and enjoy. Hansel and Gretel by the Brothers Grimm Hard by a great forest dwelt a poor woodcutter, with his wife and his two children. The boy was called Hansel, and the girl, Gretel. He had little to bite and to break, and once when great dearth fell on the land, he could no longer procure even daily bread. Now when he thought over this by night in his bed and tossed about in his anxiety, he groaned and said to his wife, What is to become of us? How are we to feed our poor children when we no longer have anything even for ourselves? I'll tell you what, husband, answered the woman. Early tomorrow morning, we will take the children out into the forest, to where it is the thickest. There we will light a fire for them, and give each of them one more piece of bread. And then we will go to our work, and leave them alone. They will not find the way home again, and we shall be rid of them. No, wife, said the man, I will not do that. How can I bear to leave my children alone in the forest? The wild animals would soon come and tear them to pieces. Oh, you fool, said she. Then we must all four die of hunger. You may as well plane the planks for our coffins. And she left him no peace until he consented. But I feel very sorry for the poor children, all the same, said the man. The two children had also not been able to sleep for hunger, and had heard what their stepmother had said to their father. Gretel wept bitter tears and said to Hansel, Now all is over with us. Be quiet, Gretel, said Hansel. Do not distress yourself. I will soon find a way to help us. And when the old folks had fallen asleep, he got up and put on his little coat, opened the door below and crept outside. The moon shone brightly and the white pebbles which lay in front of the house glittered like real silver pennies. Hansel stooped and stuffed the little pocket of his coat with as many as he could get in. Then he went back and said to Gretel, Be comforted, dear little sister, and sleep in peace. God will not forsake us. And he lay down again in his bed. And when day dawned, but before the sun had risen, the woman came and awoke the two children, saying, Get up, you sluggards. We're going into the forest to fetch wood. She gave each a little piece of bread and said, There's something for your dinner, but do not eat it up before then, for you will get nothing else. Gretel took the bread under her apron as Hansel had the pebbles in his pocket. Then they all set out together on the way to the forest. When they had walked a short time, Hansel stood still and peeped back at the house and did so again and again. His father said, Hansel, what are you looking at there and staying behind for? Pay attention, and do not forget how to use your legs. Ah, father, said Hansel, I'm looking at my little white cat, which is sitting up on the roof and wants to say goodbye to me. The wife said, Fool, that is not your little cat. That is the morning sun shining on the chimneys. Hansel, however, had not been looking back at the cat, but had been constantly throwing one of the white pebble stones out of his pocket on the road. When they had reached the middle of the forest, the father said, Now children, pile up some wood, and I will light a fire that you may not be cold. Hansel and Gretel gathered brushwood together as high as a little hill. The brushwood was lighted, And when the flames were burning very high, the woman said, Now, children, lay yourselves down by the fire and rest. We will go into the forest and cut some wood. When we have done, we will come back and fetch you away. Hansel and Gretel sat by the fire. And when noon came, each ate a little piece of bread. And as they heard the strokes of the wood axe, they believed that their father was near. It was not the axe, however, but a branch 
which he had fastened to a withered tree, which the wind was blowing backwards and forwards. And as they had been sitting such a long time, their eyes closed with fatigue, and they fell fast asleep. When at last they awoke, it was already dark night. Gretel began to cry, and said, How are we to get out of the forest now? But Hansel comforted her, and said, Just wait a little, until the moon has risen, and we will soon find the way. And when the full moon had risen, Hansel took his little sister by the hand, and followed the pebbles, which shone like newly coined silver pieces, and showed them the way. They walked the whole night long, and by break of day came once more to their father's house. They knocked at the door, and when the woman opened it, and saw that it was Hansel and Gretel, she said, You naughty children, why have you slept so long in the forest? We thought you were never coming back at all. The father, however, rejoiced, for it had cut him to the heart to leave them behind alone. Not long afterwards, there was once more great dearth throughout the land, and the children heard their mother saying at night to their father, Everything is eaten again. We have one half loaf left, and that is the end. The children must go. We will take them further into the wood, so they will not find their way out again. There is no other means of saving ourselves. The man's heart was heavy, and he thought, It would be better for you to share the last mouthful with your children. The woman, however, would listen to nothing that he had to say, and scolded and reproached him. He who says A must say B likewise, and as he had yielded the first time, he had to do a second time also. The children, however, were still awake, and had heard the conversation. And when the old folks were asleep, Hansel again got up, and wanted to go out and pick up the pebbles as he had done before. But the woman had locked the door, and Hansel could not get out. Nevertheless, he comforted his little sister and said, Do not cry, Gretel. Go to sleep quietly. The good God will help us. Early in the morning came the woman, and took the children out of their beds. Their piece of bread was given to them, but it was still smaller than the time before. On the way into the forest, Hansel crumbled his in his pocket, and often stood still and threw a morsel onto the ground. Hansel, why do you stop and look around, said the father, go on. I'm looking back at my little pigeon sitting on the roof. It wants to say goodbye to me, answered Hansel. Fool, said the woman. That is not your little pigeon, that is the morning sun shining on the chimney. Hansel, however, little by little, threw all the crumbs onto the path. The woman led the children still deeper into the forest where they had never ever in their lives been before. Then a great fire was again made, and the mother said, Sit there, you children, and when you are tired, you may sleep a little. We are going into the forest to cut wood. In the evening when we are done, we will come and fetch you away. When it was noon, Gretel shared her piece of bread with Hansel, who had scattered his by the way. Then they fell asleep, and evening passed, but no one came to the poor children. They did not awake until it was dark night, and Hansel comforted his little sister. Just wait, Gretel, until the moon rises, and we shall see the crumbs of bread that I have strewn about. They will show us our way home again. When the moon came, they set out, but they found no crumbs. For the many thousands of birds which fly about in the woods and fields had picked them all up. Hansel said to Gretel, we shall soon find the way. But they did not find it. They walked the whole night, and all the next day too, from morning till evening. But they did not get out of the forest, and they were very hungry. For they had nothing to eat but two or three berries, which grew on the ground. And as they were so weary that their legs would carry them no longer, they lay down beneath the tree and fell asleep. It was now three mornings since they had left their father's house. They began to walk again, 
they always came deeper into the forest, and if help did not come soon, they must die of hunger and weariness. When it was midday, they saw a beautiful snow-white bird sitting on a bough, which sang so beautifully and delightfully that they stood still and listened to it, and when its song was over, it spread its wings and flew away before them, and they followed it until they reached a little house, on the roof of which it alighted. And when they approached the little house, they saw that it was built of bread and covered with cakes, but that the windows were of clear sugar. We will set to work on that, said Hansel, and have a good meal. I'll eat a bit of the roof, and you, Gretel, eat some of the windows. It will taste sweet. Hansel reached up above and broke off a little of the roof to try and see how it tasted. And Gretel leant against the window and nibbled at the panes. And a soft voice cried from the parlour, Nibble, nibble, nor, who is nibbling at my little house? The children answered, The wind, the wind, the heaven-born wind, and went on eating without disturbing themselves. Hansel, who liked the taste of the roof, tore down a great piece of it, and Gretel pushed out the whole of one round window pane sat down and enjoyed herself with it. Suddenly, the door opened, and a woman as old as the hills who supported herself on crutches came creeping out. Hansel and Gretel were so terribly frightened that they let fall what they had in their hands. The old woman, however, nodded her head and said, Oh, you dear children, what has brought you here? Do come in and stay with me, no harm shall happen to you. She took them both by the hand and led them into her little house. The good food was set before them, milk and pancakes, with sugar, apples and nuts. Afterwards two pretty little beds were covered with clean white linen, and Hansel and Gretel lay down in them, and thought they were in heaven. The old woman had only pretended to be so kind. She was, in reality, a wicked witch who lay in wait for children, and had only built the little house of bread in order to entice them there. When a child fell into her power, she killed it, cooked it, ate it, and that was a feast day for her. Witches have red eyes, and they cannot see far, but they have a keen scent, like the beasts, and are aware when human beings draw near. When Hansel and Gretel came into her neighborhood, she laughed with malice and said mockingly, I have them. They shall not escape me again. Early in the morning, before the children were awake, she was already up, and when she saw both of them sleeping and looking so pretty with their plump and rosy cheeks, she muttered to herself, That will be a dainty mouthful. Then she seized Hansel with her shriveled hand, carried him into a little stable, and locked him in behind a grated door. Scream as he might, it would not help him. Then she went to Gretel, shook her till she awoke, and cried, Get up, lazy thing. Fetch some water and cook something good for your brother. He's in the stable outside and is to be made fat. When he is fat, I will eat him. Gretel began to weep bitterly, but it was all in vain, for she was forced to do what the wicked witch commanded. And now the best food was cooked for poor Hansel, but Gretel got nothing but crab shells. Every morning... The woman crept to the little stable and cried, Hansel, stretch out your finger that I may feel if you will soon be fat. Hansel, however, stretched out a little bone to her, and the old woman who had dim eyes could not see it, and thought it was Hansel's finger, and was astonished that there was no way of fattening him. When four weeks had gone by and Hansel still remained thin, she was seized with impatience and would not wait any longer. Now then, Gretel, she cried to the girl, stir yourself and bring some water. Let Hansel be fat or lean, tomorrow I will kill him and cook him. Ah, how the poor little sister did lament when she had to fetch the water, how her tears did flow down her cheeks. Dear God, do help us, she cried. If the wild beasts in the forest had but devoured us, we should at any rate have died together. Just keep your noise to yourself, said the old woman. It won't help you at all. 
early in the morning, Gretel had to go out and hang up the cauldron with the water and light the fire. We will bake first, said the old woman. I have already heated the oven and kneaded the dough. She pushed poor Gretel out to the oven, from which flames of fire were already darting. Creep in, said the witch. See if it's properly heated so we can put the bread in. And once Gretel was inside, she intended to shut the oven and let her bake in it, and then she would eat her too. But Gretel saw what she had in mind, and said, I do not know how I'm going to do it. How do I get in? Silly goose, said the old woman. The door is big enough. Look, I can get in myself. And she crept up and thrust her head into the oven, and Gretel gave her a push that drove her far into it and shut the iron door, and fastened the bolt. Then she began to howl, quite horribly, but Gretel ran away, and the godless witch was miserably burnt to death. Gretel, however, ran like lightning to Hansel, opened his little stable, and cried, Hansel, we are saved, the old witch is dead. Hansel sprang like a bird from its cage when the door is opened. How they rejoiced and embraced each other, and danced about and kissed and as they had no longer any need to fear her, they went into the witch's house, and in every corner stood chests full of pearls and jewels. These are far better than pebbles, said Hansel, and thrust into his pockets whatever could be got in. And Gretel said, I too will take something home, and filled her pinafore full. But now we must be off, said Hansel, that we may get out of the witch's forest. When they had walked for two hours, they came to a great stretch of water. We cannot cross, said Hansel. I see no foot plank and no bridge. There is also no ferry, answered Gretel. But a white duck is swimming. If I ask her, she will help us. Then she cried, Little duck, little duck, dost thou see? Hansel and Gretel are waiting for thee. There's never a plank or bridge in sight. Take us across on thy back so white. The duck came to them, and Hansel seated himself on its back and told his sister to sit by him. No, replied Gretel, that will be too heavy for the little duck. She shall take us across one after the other. The good little duck did so. And when they were once safely across and had walked for a short time, the forest seemed to be more and more familiar to them, and at length they saw from afar their father's house. They began to run. They rushed into the parlour and threw themselves around their father's neck. The man had not known one happy hour since he had left his children in the forest. The woman, however, was dead. Gretel emptied her pinafore until pearls and precious stones ran about the room, and Hansel threw one handful after another out of his pocket to add to them, and all anxiety was at an end. And they lived together in perfect happiness. Fairy Tales by the Brothers Grimm Little Red Cap Once upon a time, There was a dear little girl, who was loved by everyone who looked at her, but most of all by her grandmother, and there was nothing else that she would not have given to the child. Once she gave her a little cap of red velvet, which suited her so well that she would never wear anything else, so she was always called Little Red Cap. One day her mother said to her, Come, little red cap, here is a piece of cake and a bottle of wine. Take them to your grandmother. She is ill and weak, and they will do her good. Set out before it gets hot, and when you are going, walk nicely and quietly, and do not run off the path, or you may fall and break the bottle, and then your grandmother will get nothing. And when you go into her room, don't forget to say good morning, and don't peep into every corner before you do it. I will take great care, said Little Redcap to her mother, and gave her hand on it. 
the grandmother lived out in the wood, half a league from the village. And just as Little Redcap entered the wood, a wolf met her. Redcap did not know what a wicked creature he was, and was not at all afraid of him. Good day, Little Redcap, said he. Thank you kindly, wolf. Whither away so early, Little Redcap? To my grandmother's. What have you got in your apron? Cake and wine. Yesterday was baking day, so poor sick grandmother is to have something good to make her stronger. Where does your grandmother live, Little Redcap? A good quarter of a league farther on in the wood. Her house stands under the three large oak trees. The nut trees are just below. You surely must know it, replied Little Redcap. The wolf thought to himself, What a tender young creature, what a nice plump mouthful. She will be better to eat than the old woman. I must act craftily so as to catch both. So he walked for a short time by the side of Little Redcap, and then he said, See, Little Redcap, how pretty the flowers are about here. Why do you not look around? I believe, too, that you do not hear how sweetly the little birds are singing. You walk gravely along as if you were going to school, while everything else out here in the wood is merry. Little Redcap raised her eyes, and when she saw the sunbeams dancing, here and there through the trees, and pretty flowers growing everywhere, she thought, Suppose I take Grandmother a fresh nosegay. That would please her, too. It is so early in the day that I shall still get there in good time. And so she ran from the path into the wood to look for flowers. And whenever she had picked one, she fancied that she saw a still prettier one farther on and ran after it, and so got deeper and deeper into the wood. Meanwhile, the wolf ran straight to the grandmother's house and knocked at the door. Who is there? Little Red Cap, replied the wolf. She's bringing cake and wine. Open the door. Lift the latch, called out the grandmother. I am too weak and cannot get up. The wolf lifted the latch. The door sprang open. And without saying a word, he went straight to the grandmother's bed and devoured her. Then he put on her clothes, dressed himself in her cap, laid himself in bed, and drew the curtains. Little Red Cap, however, had been running about picking flowers, and when she had gathered so many that she could carry no more, she remembered her grandmother and set out on the way to her. She was surprised to find the cottage door standing open, and when she went into the room she had such a strange feeling that she said to herself, Oh dear, how uneasy I feel today, and at other times I like being with grandmother so much. She called out, Good morning, but received no answer. She went to the bed and drew back the curtains. There lay her grandmother with her cap pulled far over her face and looking very strange. Oh, grandmother, she said, what big ears you have. The better to hear you with, my child, was the reply. But, grandmother, what big eyes you have, she said. The better to see you with, my dear. But, Grandmother, what large hands you have, the better to hug you with? Oh, but, Grandmother, what a terrible big mouth you have, the better to eat you with. And scarcely had the wolf said this than with one bound he was out of bed and swallowed up Red Cap. When the wolf had appeased his appetite, he lay down again in the bed, fell asleep, and began to snore very loud. The huntsman was just passing the house, and thought to himself, 
How the old woman is snoring. I must just see if she wants anything. So he went into the room, and when he came to the bed, he saw that the wolf was lying in it. Do I find you here, you old sinner, said he. I have long sought you. Then just as he was going to fire at him, it occurred to him that the wolf might have devoured the grandmother, and that she might still be saved. So he did not fire, but took a pair of scissors, and began to cut open the stomach of the sleeping wolf. When he had made two snips, he saw little red cap shining. And then he made two snips more, and the little girl sprang out, crying, How frightened I have been, how dark it was inside the wolf. And after that, the aged grandmother came out alive also, but scarcely able to breathe. Redcap, however, quickly fetched great stones with which they filled the wolf's belly. And when he awoke, he wanted to run away. But the stones were so heavy that he collapsed at once and fell dead. Then all three were delighted. The huntsman drew off the wolf's skin and went home with it. The grandmother ate the cake and drank the wine which Redcap had brought. But Redcap thought to herself, As long as I live, I will never by myself leave the path to run into the wood when my mother has forbidden me to do so. It also related that once when Redcap was again taking cakes to the old grandmother, another wolf spoke to her and tried to entice her from the path. Redcap, however, was on her guard and went straight forward on her way and told her grandmother that she had met the wolf and that he had said good morning to her, but with such a wicked look in his eyes that if they had not been on the public road, she was certain he would have eaten her up. Well, said Grandmother, we will shut the door that he may not come in. Soon afterwards, the wolf knocked and cried, Open the door, Grandmother, I am Little Red Cap, and I am bringing you some cakes. But they did not speak or open the door. So the grey beard stole twice or thrice around the house, and at last jumped on the roof, intending to wait until Redcap went home in the evening to steal after her and devour her in the darkness. But the grandmother saw what was in his thoughts. In front of the house was a great stone trough. So she said to the child, Take the pale Redcap. I made some sausages yesterday. So... Carry the water in which I boiled them to the trough. Redcap carried until the great trough was quite full. The smell of sausages reached the wolf, and he sniffed and peeped down, and at last stretched out his neck so far that he could no longer keep his footing and began to slip, and slipped down from the roof straight into the great trough and was drowned. But Redcap went joyously home, and no one ever did anything to harm her again. That silly wolf. Let's read another one. Rumpelstiltskin By the side of a wood, in a country a long way off, ran a fine stream of water and upon the stream there stood a mill. The miller's house was close by, and the miller, you must know, had a very beautiful daughter. She was, moreover, very shrewd and clever, and the miller was so proud of her that he one day told the king of the land, who used to come and hunt in the wood, that his daughter could spin gold out of straw. Now this king was very fond of money, and when he heard the miller's boast his greediness was raised, he sent for the girl to be brought before him. He led her to a chamber in his palace where there was a great heap of straw, and gave her a spinning wheel and said, All this must be spun into gold before morning, as you love your life. 
It was in vain that the poor maiden said that it was only a silly boast of her father, for she could do no such thing as spin straw into gold. The chamber door was locked, and she was left alone. She sat down in one corner of the room and began to bewail her hard fate. When on a sudden the door opened and a droll-looking little man hobbled in and said, "'Good morrow to you, my dear lass. What are you weeping for?' "'Alas,' said she, "'I must spin this straw into gold, and I know not how.' "'What will you give me?' said the hobgoblin. "'To do it for you.' "'My necklace,' replied the maiden. He took her at her word and sat himself down to the wheel and whistled and sang, Round about, round about, lo and behold, reel away, reel away, straw into gold. And round about the wheel went merrily, the work was quickly done, and the straw was all spun into gold. When the king came and saw this, he was greatly astonished and pleased, but his heart grew still more greedy of gain. He shut up the poor miller's daughter again with a fresh task. Then she knew not what to do and sat down once more to weep, but the dwarf soon opened the door and said, What will you give me to do your task? The ring on my finger, said she. So her little friend took the ring and began to work at the wheel again and whistled and sang. Round about, round about, lo and behold, reel away, reel away, straw into gold. Long before morning all was done again. The king was greatly delighted to see all this glittering treasure, but still he had not enough. He took the miller's daughter to a yet larger heap and said, all this must be spun tonight, and if it is, you shall be my queen. As soon as she was alone, that dwarf came in and said, What will you give me to spin gold for you this third time? I have nothing left, said she. Then say you will give me, said the little man, the first little child you may have when you are queen. That may never be, thought the miller's daughter, and as she knew no other way to get her task done, she said she would do what he asked. Round went the wheel again to the old song. The mannequin once more spun the heap into gold. The king came in the morning and finding all he wanted was forced to keep his word. So he married the miller's daughter and she really became queen. At the birth of her first little child she was very glad and forgot the dwarf and what she had said. But one day he came into her room where she was sitting playing with her baby, and put her in mind of it. Then she grieved sorely at her misfortune and said she would give him all the wealth in the kingdom if he would let her off, but in vain, till at last her tears softened him and he said, I will give you three days grace and if during that time you tell me my name, you shall keep your child. The queen lay awake all night, thinking of all the odd names she had ever heard. She sent messengers all over the land to find out new ones. The next day the little man came, and she began with Timothy, Ichabod, Benjamin, Jeremiah, all the names that she could remember. But to all and each of them he said, Madam, that is not my name. The second day she began with all the comical names that she could hear, Bandylegs, Hunchback, Crookshanks, and so on. The little gentleman still said to every one of them, Madam, that is not my name. The third day one of the messengers came back and said, I have travelled two days without hearing of any other names, but yesterday... As I was climbing a high hill among the trees of the forest where the fox and the hare bid each other good night, I saw a little hut. Before the hut burnt a fire, and round the fire a funny little dwarf was dancing, up on one leg, and singing, Merrily the feast I'll make, today I'll brew, tomorrow bake, 
Merrily I'll dance and sing, For the next day will a stranger bring. Little does my lady dream, Rumpelstiltskin is my name. When the queen heard this, she jumped for joy, and as soon as her little friend came, she sat down upon her throne, called all of her court round to enjoy the fun. The nurse stood by her side with the baby in her arms, as if it was quite ready to be given up. The little man began to chuckle at the thought of having the poor child to take home with him to his hut in the woods. He cried out, "'Now, lady, what is my name?' "'Is it John?' asked she. "'No, madam. Is it Tom?' "'No, madam. Is it Jemmy?' "'It is not. Can your name be?' "'Rumpelstiltskin,' said the lady slyly. "'Some witch told you that. Some witch told you that,' cried the little man, and dashed his right foot in a rage so deep into the floor that he was forced to lay hold of it with both hands to pull it out. Then he made the best of his way off, while the nurse laughed and the baby crowed and all the court jeered at him for having had so much trouble for nothing, and said, "'We wish you a very good morning and a merry feast, Mr. Rumpelstiltskin.'" Shall we have one more, just in case you need a little bit of extra time to get down to sleep tonight? The Golden Goose There was a man who had three sons, the youngest of whom was called Dumbling, and was despised, mocked, and sneered at on every occasion. It happened that the eldest wanted to go into the forest to hew wood, and before he went his mother gave him a beautiful sweet cake and a bottle of wine in order that he might not suffer from hunger or thirst. When he entered the forest he met a little grey-haired old man, who bade him good day and said, Do give me a piece of cake out of your pocket and let me have a draught of your wine. I am so hungry and thirsty. But the clever son answered, If I give you my cake and wine, I shall have none for myself. Be off with you. And he left the little man standing and went on. But when he began to hew down a tree, it was not long before he made a false stroke and the axe cut him in the arm, so that he had to go home and have it bound up. And this was the little grey man's doing. After this, the second son went into the forest, and his mother gave him, like the eldest, a cake and a bottle of wine. The little old grey man met him likewise, and asked him for a piece of cake and a drink of wine. But the second son, too, said sensibly enough, "'What I give you will be taken away from myself. Be off.' And he left the little man standing and went on. His punishment, however, was not delayed. When he had made a few blows to the tree, he struck himself in the leg and had to be carried home. Then Dumbling said, Father, do let me go and cut wood. The father answered, Your brothers have hurt themselves with it. Leave it alone. You do not understand anything about it. But Dumbling begged so long that at last he said, Just go then. You will get wiser by hurting yourself. His mother gave him a cake made with water and baked in the cinders and a bottle of sour beer. When he came to the forest, the little old grey man met him likewise and greeting him said, Give me a piece of your cake and a drink out of your bottle. I am so hungry and thirsty. Dumbling answered, I have only cinder cake and sour beer if that pleases you. We will sit down and eat. So they sat down, and when Dumbling pulled out his cinder cake, it was a fine sweet cake, and the sour beer had become good wine. So they ate and drank, and after that the little man said, Since you have a good heart and are willing to divide what you have, I will give you good luck. There stands an old tree, cut it down. You will find something at the roots. Then the little man took leave of him. 
Dumbling went and cut down the tree. And when it fell, there was a goose sitting in the roots with feathers of pure gold. He lifted her up and, taking her with him, went to an inn where he thought he would stay the night. Now the host had three daughters who saw the goose and were curious to know what such a wonderful bird might be, and would have liked to have one of its golden feathers. The eldest thought, I shall soon find an opportunity of pulling out a feather. And as soon as Dumbling had gone out, she seized the goose by the wing, but her finger and hand remained sticking fast to it. The second came soon afterwards, thinking only of how she might get a feather for herself, but she had scarcely touched her sister than she was held fast. At last the third also came with the like intent, and the others screamed out, Keep away, for goodness sake, keep away. But she did not understand why she was to keep away. The others are there, she thought I may as well be there too, and she ran to them. But as soon as she had touched her sister, she remained sticking fast to her. So they had to spend the night with the goose. The next morning, Dumbling took the goose under his arm and set out without troubling himself about the three girls who were hanging on to it. They were obliged to run after him continually, now left, now right, wherever his legs took him. In the middle of the fields, the parson met them. And when he saw the procession, he said, For shame, you good-for-nothing girls. Why are you running across the fields after this young man? Is that seemly? At the same time, he seized the youngest by the hand in order to pull her away. But as soon as he touched her, he likewise stuck fast, and was himself obliged to run behind. Before long, the sexton came by and saw his master, the parson, running behind three girls. He was astonished at this, and called out, "'Hi, your reverence, wither away so quickly. Do not forget we have a christening today.' And running after him, he took him by the sleeve, but was also held fast to it. Whilst the five were trotting, thus one behind the other, two labourers came with their hoes from the fields. The parson called out to them and begged that they would set him and the sexton free. They had scarcely touched the sexton when they were held fast, and now there were seven of them running behind Dumbling and the goose. Soon afterwards he came to a city, where a king ruled, who had a daughter who was so serious that no one could make her laugh. He had put forth a decree that whosoever should be able to make her laugh should marry her. When Dumbling heard this, he went with his goose and all her train before the king's daughter. As soon as she saw the seven people running on and on, one behind the other, she began to laugh quite loudly, as if she would never stop. Thereupon Dumbling asked to have her for his wife. But the king did not like the son-in-law and made all manner of excuses and said he must first produce a man who could drink a cellar full of wine. Dumbling thought of the little grey man who could certainly help him. So he went into the forest. And in the same place where he had felled the tree he saw a man sitting who had a very sorrowful face. Dumbling asked him, what he was taking to heart so sorely. And he answered, I have such a great thirst and cannot quench it, cold water I cannot stand, a barrel of wine I have just emptied, but that to me is like a drop on a hot stone. There I can help you, said Dumbling. Come with me, you shall be satisfied. He led him into the king's cellar, and the man bent over the huge barrels and drank and drank until his loins hurt. Before the day was out, he had emptied all of the barrels. Dumbling asked once more for his bride, but the king was vexed that such an ugly fellow, whom everyone called Dumbling, should take away his daughter. And he made a new condition. He must first find a man who could eat a whole mountain of bread. 
Dumbling did not think long, but went straight into the forest, where in the same place there sat a man, who was tying up his body with a strap, making an awful face, and saying, I have eaten a whole oven full of rolls, but what good is that when one has such a hunger as I? My stomach remains empty, and I must tie myself up if I am not to die of hunger. At this, Dumbling was glad, and said, Get up and come with me, you shall eat yourself full. He led him to the king's palace, where all the flour in the whole kingdom was collected, and from it he caused a huge mountain of bread to be baked. The man from the forest stood before it and began to eat. By the end of one day the whole mountain had vanished. Dumbling for the third time asked for his bride. But the king again sought a way out and ordered a ship which could sail on land and on water. As soon as you come sailing back in it, said he, you shall have my daughter for wife. Dumbling went straight into the forest and there sat the little grey man to whom he had given his cake. When he heard what Dumbling wanted, he said, since you have given me to eat and to drink, I will give you the ship and I do all of this because you once were kind to me. Then he gave him the ship, which could sail on land and water, and when the king saw that, he could no longer prevent him from having his daughter. The wedding was celebrated, and after the king's death, Dumbling inherited his kingdom and lived for a long time contentedly with his wife. Snow White and Rose Red There was once a poor widow who lived in a lonely cottage. In front of the cottage was a garden wherein stood two rose trees, one of which bore white and the other red roses. She had two children who were like the two rose trees, and one was called Snow White and the other Rose Red. They were as good and happy, as busy and cheerful as ever two children in the world were. Only Snow White was more quiet and gentle than Rose Red. Rose Red liked better to run about in the meadows and fields, seeking flowers and catching butterflies. But Snow White sat at home with her mother and helped her with her housework, or read to her when there was nothing to do. The two children were so fond of one another that they always held each other by the hand when they were out together. And when Snow White said, We will not leave each other, Rose Red answered, Never, so long as we live. And their mother would add, What one has, she must share with the other. They often ran about the forest alone and gathered red berries, and no beasts did them any harm, but came close to them, trustfully. The little hare would eat a cabbage leaf out of their hands, the roe grazed by their side, the stag leapt merrily by them, and the birds sat still upon the boughs and sang whatever they knew. No mishap overtook them. If they had stayed too late in the forest and night came on, they laid themselves down near one another upon the moss and slept until morning came, and their mother knew this and did not worry on their account. Once, when they had spent the night in the wood, and the dawn had roused them, they saw a beautiful child in a shining white dress, sitting near their bed. He got up and looked quite kindly at them, but said nothing, and went into the forest. And when they looked round, they found that they had been sleeping quite close to a precipice, and would certainly have fallen into it in the darkness if they had gone only a few paces further. Their mother told them it must have been the angel who watches over good children. Snow White and Rose Red kept their mother's little cottage so neat that it was a pleasure to look inside it. In the summer, Rose Red took care of the house, and every morning laid a wreath of flowers by her mother's bed before she awoke, in which was a rose from each tree. In the winter, Snow White lit the fire and hung the kettle on the hob, the kettle was of brass and shone like gold, so brightly was it polished. In the evening, when the snowflakes fell, the mother said, 
go Snow White and bolt the door. And then they sat round the hearth, and the mother took her spectacles, and read aloud out of a large book. And the two girls listened as they sat and spun. Close by them lay a lamb upon the floor, and behind them upon a perch sat a white dove with its head hidden beneath its wings. One evening, as they were thus sitting comfortably together, someone knocked at the door as if he wished to be let in. The mother said, Quick, Rose Red, open the door. It must be a traveller who is seeking shelter. Rose Red went and pushed back the bolt, thinking that it was a poor man, but it was not. It was a bear that stretched his broad black head within the door. Rose Red screamed and sprang back. The lamb bleated, the dove fluttered, and Snow White hid herself behind her mother's bed. But the bear began to speak, and said, Do not be afraid. I will do you no harm. I am half frozen, and only want to warm myself a little beside you. Or bear, said the mother, lie down by the fire. Only take care that you do not burn your coat. And then she cried, Snow White, Rose Red, come out. The bear will do you no harm. He means well. So they both came out. And by the by, the lamb and dove came nearer and were not afraid of him. The bear said, Here, children, knock the snow out of my coat a little. So they brought the broom and swept the bear's hide clean, and he stretched himself by the fire and growled contentedly and comfortably. It was not long before they grew quite at home, and played tricks with their clumsy guest. They tugged his hair with their hands, put their feet upon his back, and rolled him about, or they took a hazel switch and beat him, and when he growled they laughed. But the bear took it all in good part. Only when they were too rough he called out, Leave me alive, children. Snow White, Rose Red, will you beat your wooer dead? When it was bedtime and the others went to bed, the mother said to the bear, You can lie there by the hearth that you will be safe from the cold and the bad weather. As soon as day dawned, the two children let him out, and he trotted across the snow into the forest. Henceforth, the bear came every evening at the same time, laid himself down by the hearth, and let the children amuse themselves with him as much as they liked. They got so used to him that the doors were never fastened until their black friend had arrived. When spring had come and all outside was green, the bear said one morning to Snow White, Now I must go away, and cannot come back for the whole summer. Where are you going then, dear bear? asked Snow White. I must go into the forest and guard my treasures from the wicked dwarfs. In the winter, when the earth is frozen hard, they are obliged to stay below, and cannot work their way through. But now, when the sun has thawed and warmed the earth, they break through, and come out to pry and steal, and what once gets into their hands and in their caves does not easily see daylight again. Snow White was quite sorry at his departure, and as she unbolted the door for him, and the bear was hurrying out, he caught against the bolt and a piece of his hairy coat was torn off, and it seemed to Snow White as if she had seen gold shining through it. She was not sure about it. The bear ran away quickly and was soon out of sight, behind the trees. A short time afterwards, the mother sent her children into the forest to get firewood. There they found a big tree, which lay felled on the ground. Close by the trunk something was jumping backwards and forwards in the grass. They could not make out what it was. When they came nearer, they saw a dwarf, with an old withered face, and a snow-white beard a yard long. The end of the beard was caught in a crevice of the tree. The little fellow was jumping about like a dog tied to a rope, and did not know what to do. He glared at the girls with his fiery red eyes and cried, Why do you stand there? Can you not come here and help me? What you up to, little man? asked Rose Red. You stupid prying goose, answered the dwarf. I was going to split the tree to get a little wood for cooking. The little bit of food that we people get is immediately burnt up with heavy logs. We do not swallow as much as you coarse, greedy folk. 
I had just driven the wedge safely in, and everything was going as I wished, but the cursed wedge was too smooth, and suddenly sprang out. The tree closed so quickly I could not pull out my beautiful white beard. So now it is tight, and I cannot get away. And the silly, sleek, milk-faced things laugh how odious you are. The children tried very hard, but they could not pull the beard out. It was caught too fast. I'll run and fetch something, said Rose Red. You senseless goose, snarled the dwarf. Why should you fetch someone? You were already too, too many for me. Can you not think of something better? Don't be impatient, said Snow White. I will help you. She pulled her scissors out of her pocket and cut off the end of the beard. As soon as the dwarf felt himself free, he laid hold of a bag which lay amongst the roots of the tree and was full of gold. He lifted it up, grumbling to himself, Uncouth people, cut off a piece of my fine beard, bad luck to you. He swung the bag upon his back and went off without even once looking at the children. Some time afterwards, Snow White and Rose Red went to catch a dish of fish. As they came near the brook, they saw something like a large grasshopper jumping towards the water, as if it were going to leap in. They ran to it and found it was the dwarf. "'Where are you going?' said Rose Red. "'You surely don't want to go into the water.' "'I'm not such a fool,' cried the dwarf. "'Don't you see that the accursed fish wants to pull me in?' The little man had been sitting there fishing, and unluckily the wind had tangled up his beard with the fishing line. A moment later, a big fish made a bite, and the feeble creature had not strength to pull it out. The fish kept the upper hand, and pulled the dwarf towards him. He held on to all the reeds and rushes, but it was of little good for he was forced to follow the movements of the fish, and was in urgent danger of being dragged into the water. The girls came just in time. They held him fast and tried to free his beard from the line, but all in vain. Beard and line were entangled fast together. There was nothing to do but bring out the scissors and cut the beard, whereby a small part of it was lost. When the dwarf saw that, he screamed out, is that civil, you toadstool, to disfigure a man's face? Was it not enough to clip off the end of my beard? Now you've cut off the best part of it. I cannot let myself be seen by my people. I wish you had been made to run the soles off your shoes. He took out a sack of pearls which lay in the rushes, and without another word he dragged it away and disappeared behind a stone. It happened that soon afterwards the mother sent the two children to the town to buy needles and thread, and laces and ribbons. The road led them across a heath upon which huge pieces of rock lay strewn about. There they noticed a large bird hovering in the air, flying slowly round and round above them. It sank lower and lower and at last settled near a rock not far away. Immediately they heard a loud, piteous cry. They ran up and saw with horror that the eagle had seized their old acquaintance, the dwarf, and was going to carry him off. The children, full of pity, at once took tight hold of the little man and pulled against the eagle so long that at last he let his booty go. As soon as the dwarf had recovered from his first fright, he cried with his shrill voice, could you not have done it more carefully? You dragged at my brown coat, so now it's all torn and full of holes, you clumsy creatures. He took up a sack full of precious stones and slipped away, again under the rock into his hole. The girls, who by this time were used to his ingratitude, went on their way and did their business in town. As they crossed the heath again on their way home, they surprised the dwarf, who had emptied out his bag of precious stones in a clean spot, and had not thought that anyone would come there so late. The evening sun shone upon the brilliant stones. They glittered and sparkled with all colours so beautifully that the children stood still and stared at them. "'Why do you stand gaping there?' cried the dwarf. His ashen grey face became copper-red with rage. He was still cursing when a loud, 
growling was heard, and a black bear came trotting towards them out of the forest. The dwarf sprang up in a fright, but he could not reach his cave. The bear was already close. Then, in the dread of his heart, he cried, Dear Mr. Bear, spare me. I will give you all of my treasures. Look, the beautiful jewels lying there. Grant me my life. What do you want with such a slender little fellow as I? You would not feel me between your teeth. Come, take these two wicked girls. They're tender morsels for you, fat as young quails. For mercy's sake, eat them. The bear took no heed of his words, but gave the wicked creature a single blow with his paw, and he did not move again. The girls had run away, but the bear called to them. Snow White, Rose Red, do not be afraid. Wait, I will come with you. Then they recognized his voice and waited. And when he came up to them, suddenly his bear skin fell off, and he stood there, a handsome man, clothed all in gold. I'm a king's son, he said. I was bewitched by that wicked dwarf who had stolen my treasures. I have had to run about the forest as a savage bear till I was freed by his death. Now he has got his well-deserved punishment. Snow White was married to him, and Rose Red to his brother, and they divided between them the great treasure which the dwarf had gathered together in his cave. The old mother lived peacefully and happily with her children for many years. She took the two rose trees with her, and they stood before her window, and every year bore the most beautiful roses, white and red. The Elves and the Shoemaker There was once a shoemaker who worked very hard and was very honest, but still he could not earn enough to live upon, and at last all he had in the world was gone, save just leather enough to make one pair of shoes. Then he cut his leather out all ready to make up the next day, meaning to rise early in the morning to his work. His conscience was clear and his heart light amidst all his troubles. So he went peaceably to bed, left all his cares to heaven and soon fell asleep. In the morning after he had said his prayers, he sat himself down to his work, when, to his great wonder, there stood the shoes already made upon the table. The good man knew not what to say or think at such an odd thing happening. He looked at the workmanship. There was not one false stitch in the whole job. All was so neat and true that it was quite a masterpiece. The same day a customer came in, and the shoes suited him so well that he willingly paid a price higher than usual for them. And the poor shoemaker with the money bought leather enough to make two pairs more. In the evening he cut out the work and went to bed early, that he might get up and begin betimes next day. But he was saved all the trouble, for when he got up in the morning, the work was done, ready to his hand. Soon in came buyers who paid handsomely for his goods. He bought leather enough for four pair more. He cut out the work again overnight and found it done in the morning as before, and so it went on for some time. What was got ready in the evening was always done by daybreak, and the good man soon became thriving and well off again. One evening, about Christmas time, as he and his wife were sitting over the fire, chatting together, he said to her, I should like to sit up and watch tonight, that we may see who it is that comes and does my work for me. The wife liked the thought, so they left a light burning and hid themselves in a corner of the room, behind a curtain that was hung up there and watched what would happen. As soon as it was midnight, there came in two little naked dwarfs, and they sat themselves upon the shoemaker's bench, took up all the work that was cut out and began to ply with their little fingers, stitching and rapping and tapping away at such a rate that the shoemaker was all wonder, 
and could not take his eyes off of them. On they went, until the job was quite done, and the shoes stood ready for use upon the table. This was long before daybreak, and they bustled away as quick as lightning. The next day the wife said to the shoemaker, "'These little whites have made us rich. We ought to be thankful to them and do them a good turn if we can. Quite sorry to see them run about as they do, and indeed it is not very decent. They have nothing upon their backs to keep off the cold. I'll tell you what, I'll make each of them a shirt, and a coat, and a waistcoat, and a pair of pantaloons into the bargain. And do you make each of them a little pair of shoes?' The thought pleased the good cobbler very much, and one evening, when all the things were ready, they laid them on the table, instead of the work that they used to cut out, and they went and hid themselves to watch what the little elves would do. About midnight, in they came, dancing, skipping, hopped around the room, and then went to sit down to their work as usual. But when they saw the clothes lying for them, they laughed and chuckled and seemed mightily delighted. They dressed themselves in the twinkling of an eye. They danced and capered and sprang about, as merry as could be, till at last they danced out the door and away over the green. The good couple saw them no more, but everything went well with them from that time forward as long as they lived. Our first story tonight will be The Frog Prince. One fine evening, a young princess put on her bonnet and clogs, and went out to take a walk by herself in a wood, and when she came to a cool spring of water that rose in the midst of it, she sat herself down to rest a while. Now she had a golden ball in her hand, which was her favourite plaything. She was always tossing it up in the air, and catching it again as it fell. After a time she threw it up so high that she missed catching it as it fell, and the ball bounded away and rolled along upon the ground, till at last it fell into the spring. The princess looked into the spring after her ball, but it was very deep, so deep that she could not see the bottom of it. Then she began to bewail her loss, and said, Alas, if I could only get my ball again, I would give all of my fine clothes and jewels and everything that I have in the world. Whilst she was speaking, a frog put its head out of the water, and said, Princess, why do you weep so bitterly? Alas, said she, what can you do for me, you nasty frog? My golden ball has fallen into the spring. The frog said, I want not your pearls and jewels and fine clothes, but if you will love me, then let me live with you, and eat from off your golden plate, and sleep upon your bed, I will bring you your ball back. What nonsense, thought the princess, this silly frog is talking, he can never even get out of the spring to visit me, though he may be able to get my ball for me, and therefore I will tell him he shall have what he asks. So she said to the frog, Well, if you bring me my ball... I will do as you ask. And then the frog put his head down and dived deep under the water. And after a little while, he came up again with the ball in his mouth and threw it on the edge of the spring. As soon as the young princess saw the ball, she ran to pick it up and she was so overjoyed to have it in her hand again that she never thought of the frog. And she ran home as fast as she could. The frog called after her, Stay, princess, and take me with you as you said but she did not stop to hear a word. The next day, just as the princess had sat down to dinner, she heard a strange noise. Tap, tap, plash, plash, as if something was coming up the marble staircase. And soon afterwards there was a gentle knock at the door, and a little voice cried out and said, Open the door, my princess dear, open the door to thy true love here, and mind the words that thou and I said by the fountain cool, in the greenwood shade. The princess ran to the door and opened it, and there she saw the frog, whom she had quite forgotten. At this sight she was sadly frightened, and shutting the door as fast as she could, came back to her seat. The king, her father, seeing that something had frightened her, asked her what was the matter. 
There is a nasty frog, said she, at the door that lifted my bull for me out of the spring this morning. I told him that he should live with me here, thinking that he could never get out of the spring. But there he is at the door, and he wants to come in. While she was speaking, the frog knocked again at the door and said, Open the door, my princess dear, open the door to thy true love here, and mind the words that thou and I said by the fountain cool in the greenwood shade. Then the king said to the young princess, As you have given your word, you must keep it, so go and let him in. She did so, and the frog hopped into the room, and straight on, tap, tap, push, push, from the bottom of the room to the top, till he came up close to the table where the princess sat. Pray, lift me upon a chair, said he to the princess, and let me sit next to you. As soon as she had done this, the frog said, Put your plate nearer to me, that I may eat out of it. This she did, and when he had eaten as much as he could, he said, Now I am tired. Carry me upstairs and put me into your bed. And the princess, though very unwilling, took him up in her hand, and put him upon the pillow of her own bed, where he slept all night long. As soon it was light, he jumped up, hopped downstairs, and went out of the house. Now then, thought the princess, at last he is gone, and I shall be troubled with him no more. But she was mistaken. When night came again, she heard the same tapping at the door, and the frog once more said, Open the door, my princess dear, open the door to thy true love here, and mind the words that thou and I said, by the fountain cool in the greenwood shade. And when the princess opened the door, the frog came in and slept upon her pillow as before, till the morning broke. And the third night he did the same. But when the princess awoke on the following morning, she was astonished to see, instead of the frog, a handsome prince, gazing on her with the most beautiful eyes that she had ever seen, and standing at the head of her bed. He told her he had been enchanted by a spiteful fairy, who had changed him into a frog, and that he had been fated so to abide until some princess should take him out of the spring and let him eat from her plate and sleep upon her bed for three nights. You, said the prince, have broken this cruel charm, and now I have nothing to wish for but that you should go with me into my father's kingdom, where I will marry you and love you for as long as you live. The young princess, you may be sure, was not long in saying yes to all of this, and as they spoke a gay coach drove up with eight beautiful horses, decked with plumes of feathers and a golden harness, and behind the coach rode the prince's servant, faithful Heinrich, who had bewailed the misfortunes of his dear master during his enchantment so long and so bitterly that his heart had well nigh burst. They then took leave of the king, and got into the coach with eight horses, and all set out, full of joy and merriment, for the prince's kingdom, which they reached safely. And there they lived happily a great many years. The end. Let's read another one. Rapunzel. There were once a man and a woman who had long in vain wished for a child. At length the woman hoped that God was about to grant her desire. These people had a little window at the back of their house, from which a splendid garden could be seen, which was full of the most beautiful flowers and herbs. It was, however, surrounded by a high wall, and no one dared to go into it because it belonged to an enchantress, who had great power and was dreaded by all the world. One day the woman was standing by this window and looking down into the garden, when she saw a bed which was planted with the most beautiful rampion and it looked so fresh and green that she longed for it, she quite pined away, and began to look pale and miserable. Then her husband was alarmed and asked, What ails you, dear wife? Ah, she replied, If I can't eat some of the rampion which is in the garden behind our house, I shall die. The man who loved her thought, Sooner than let your wife die, bring her some of the rampion yourself. Let it cost what it will. At twilight, he clambered down over the wall into the garden of the enchantress, hastily clutched a handful of rampion, and took it to his wife. She at once made herself a salad of it and ate it greedily. It tasted so good to her, so very good, 
that the next day she longed for it three times as much as before. If he was to have any rest, her husband must once more descend into the garden. In the gloom of evening, he let himself down again, and when he clambered down the wall he was terribly afraid, for he saw the enchantress standing before him. "'How can you dare?' she said with an angry look. "'Descend into my garden and steal my rampion like a thief. "'You shall suffer for it.' "'Ah,' answered he, "'let mercy take the place of justice. "'I only made up my mind to do it out of necessity. "'My wife saw your rampion from the window "'and felt such a longing for it "'that she would have died if she had not got some to eat.' "'Then the enchantress allowed her anger to be softened "'and said to him, if the case be as you say, I will allow you to take away with you as much rampion as you will. Only I make one condition. You must give me the child which your wife will bring into the world. It shall be well treated, and I will care for it like a mother. The man in his terror consented to everything, and when the woman was brought to bed, the enchantress appeared at once, gave the child the name of Rapunzel, and took it away with her. Rapunzel grew into the most beautiful child under the sun. When she was twelve years old, the enchantress shut her into a tower which lay in a forest and had neither stairs nor door, but quite at the top was a little window. When the enchantress wanted to go in, she placed herself beneath it and cried, Rapunzel, Rapunzel, let down your hair to me. Rapunzel had magnificent long hair, fine as spun gold, and when she heard the voice of the enchantress, she unfastened her braided tresses, wound them round one of the hooks of the window above, and then the hair fell twenty ells down, and the enchantress climbed up by it. After a year or two it came to pass that the king's son rode through the forest and passed by the tower. Then he heard a song, which was so charming, that he stood still and listened. This was Rapunzel who in her solitude passed her time in letting her sweet voice resound. The king's son wanted to climb up to her, and looked for the door to the tower, but none was to be found. He rode home, but the singing had so deeply touched his heart, that every day he went out into the forest and listened to it. Once when he was thus standing behind a tree, he saw that an enchantress came there, and he heard how she cried, Rapunzel, Rapunzel, let down your hair to me. Then Rapunzel let down her braids of her hair, and the enchantress climbed up to her. If that is the ladder by which one mounts, I too will try my fortune, said he. And the next day, when it began to grow dark, he went to the tower and cried, Rapunzel, Rapunzel, let down your hair to me. Immediately the hair fell down, and the king's son climbed up. At first Rapunzel was terribly frightened, when a man, such as her eyes had never yet beheld, came to her. But the king's son began to talk to her quite like a friend, and told her that his heart had been so stirred that it had let him have no rest, and he had been forced to see her. Then Rapunzel lost her fear, and when he asked her if she would take him for a husband, and she saw that he was young and handsome, she thought, he will love me more than old Dame Gothel does, and she said yes, and laid her hand in his. She said, I will willingly go away with you, but I do not know how to get down. Bring with you a skein of silk every time you come, and I will weave a ladder with it, and when that is ready I will descend, and you will take me on your horse. They agreed that until that time he should come to her every evening, for the old woman came by day. The enchantress remarked nothing of this until once Rapunzel said to her, Tell me, Dame Gothel, how it happens that you are so much heavier for me to draw up than the young king's son, he is with me in a moment. "'Ah, you wicked child!' cried the enchantress. "'What do I hear you say? "'I thought I had separated you from all the world, "'and yet you have deceived me.' "'In her anger she clutched Rapunzel's beautiful tresses, "'wrapped them twice around her left hand, "'seized a pair of scissors with the right, and snip-snap. "'They were cut off, and the lovely braids lay on the ground, "'and she was so pitiless that she took poor Rapunzel into a desert, "'where she had to live in great grief and misery.' On the same day that she cast Rapunzel out, the enchantress fastened the braids of hair which she had cut off to the hook of the window, and when the king's son came and cried, Rapunzel, Rapunzel, let down your hair to me, she let the hair down. The king's son ascended, 
but instead of finding his dearest Rapunzel, he found the Enchantress, who gazed at him with a wicked and venomous look. Aha! she cried mockingly. You would fetch your dearest, but the beautiful bird sits no longer singing in the nest. The cat has got it, and will scratch out your eyes as well. Rapunzel is lost to you. You will never see her again. The king's son was beside himself with pain, and in his despair he leapt down from the tower. He escaped with his life, but the thorns into which he fell pierced his eyes. He wandered quite blind about the forest, ate nothing but roots and berries, and did naught but lament and weep over the loss of his dearest wife. Thus he roamed about in misery for some years, and at length came to the desert, where Rapunzel, with the twins to which she had given birth, a boy and a girl, lived in wretchedness. He heard a voice, and it seemed so familiar to him that he went towards it, and when he approached Rapunzel, Rapunzel knew him, and fell on his neck and wept. Two of her tears wetted his eyes, and they grew clear again, and he could see with them as before. He led her to his kingdom, where he was joyfully received, and they lived for a long time, happy and contented. The End Catskin There was once a king whose queen had hair of the purest gold, and was so beautiful that her match was not to be met with on the whole face of the earth. But this beautiful queen fell ill, and when she felt that her end drew near, she called the king to her and said, Promise me that you will never marry again, unless you meet with a wife who is as beautiful as I am, and has golden hair like mine. Then when the king in his grief promised all that she asked, she shut her eyes and died. But the king was not to be comforted, and for a long time never thought of taking another wife. At last, however, his wise men said, This will not do, the king must marry again, that we may have a queen. So messengers were sent, far and wide, to seek for a bride as beautiful as the late queen. But there was no princess in the world so beautiful, and if there had been, still there was not one to be found who had golden hair. So the messengers came home, and had all their trouble for nothing. Now the king had a daughter who was just as beautiful as her mother and had the same golden hair, and when she was grown up, the king looked at her and thought that she looked just like the late queen, and he said to his courtiers, May I not marry my daughter? She's the very image of my dead wife. Unless I have her, I shall not find any bride upon the whole earth, and you say there must be a queen. When the courtiers heard this, they were shocked and said, Heaven forbid a father should marry his daughter. Out of so great a sin no good can come and his daughter was also shocked, but hoped that the king would soon give up such thoughts, so said to him, Before I marry anyone I must have three dresses. One must be of gold, like the sun, another must be shining silver like the moon, and a third must be as dazzling as the stars. Besides, I want a mantle of a thousand different kinds of fur put together to which every beast in the kingdom must give a part of his skin, and thus she thought that he would think of this matter no more. But the king made the most skilful workman weave the three dresses, one golden like the sun, another silvery like the moon, and a third sparkling like the stars. And his hunters were told to hunt all over for the beasts in the kingdom, and to take the finest fur out of their skins and a mantle of a thousand furs was made. When all were ready, the king sent them to her, but she got up in the night when all were asleep and took three of her trinkets, a golden ring, a golden necklace, and a golden brooch, and packed the three dresses of the sun, the moon, and the stars up in a nutshell, and wrapped herself up in the mantle made of all sorts of fur, besmeared her face and hands with soot, and threw herself upon heaven for help in her need, and went away and journeyed the whole night, till at last she came to a large wood. As she was very tired, she sat herself down, in the hollow of a tree, and soon fell asleep. And there she slept on until it was midday. 
Now, as the king to whom the wood belonged was hunting in it, his dogs came to the tree and began to sniff around, and run around and round and bark. Look sharp, said the king to the huntsman, and see what sort of game lies there. And the huntsman went up to the tree, and when they came back again, said, In the hollow tree there lies a most wonderful beast, such as we have never seen before. Its skin seems to be of a thousand kinds of fur, but there it lies, fast asleep. See, said the king, if you can catch it alive, and we will take it with us. So the huntsman took it up, and the maiden awoke and was greatly frightened, and said, I am a poor child that has neither father nor mother left. Have pity on me and take me with you. They then said, Yes, Miss Catskin, you will do for the kitchen. You can sweep the ashes and do things of that sort. So they put her into the coach, and took her home to the king's palace. Then they showed her a little corner under the staircase where no light of day ever peeped in, and said, Catskin, you may lie and sleep there. And so she was sent into the kitchen and made to fetch wood and water and blow the fire and pluck the poultry and pick the herbs and sift the ashes and do all the dirty work. Thus Catskin lived a long time, very sorrowfully. Ah, pretty princess, thought she, what will now become of thee? But it happened one day that a feast was to be held in the king's castle, so she said to the cook, May I go up a little while and see what's going on? I will take care and stand behind the door. And the cook said, Yes, you may go, but be back again in half an hour's time to rake out the ashes. She took her little lamp and went into her cabin and took off the fur skin and washed the soot from her face and hands so that her beauty shone forth like the sun from behind the clouds. She opened her nutshell and brought out of it a dress that shone like the sun and went to the feast. Everyone made way for her, for nobody knew her, and they thought she could be no less than a king's daughter. But the king came up to her and held out his hand and danced with her, and he thought in his heart, I never saw anyone half as beautiful. When the dance was at an end, she curtsied, and when the king looked round for her, she was gone. No one knew why there. The guards that stood at the castle gate were called in, but they had seen no one. The truth was that she had run into her little cabin and pulled off her dress and blackened her face and hands and put on the fur skin cloak and was cat skin again. And when she went into the kitchen to her work and began to rake the ashes, the cook said, Let that alone till morning and heat the king's soup. I should like to run up now and give a peep, but take care that you don't let a hair fall into it or you will run a chance of never eating again. As soon as the cook went away, Catskin heated the king's soup and toasted a slice of bread first as nicely as she ever could, and when it was ready she went and looked in the cabin for her little golden ring, and put it into the dish in which the soup was. When the dance was over, the king ordered his soup to be brought in, and it pleased him so well that he thought he had never tasted any so good before. At the bottom he saw a gold ring lying, and as he could not make out how it had got there, he ordered the cook to be sent for. The cook was frightened when he heard the order and said to Catskin, You must have let a hair fall into the soup. If it be so, you will have a good beating. Then he went before the king, and he asked him who had cooked the soup. I did, answered the cook. But the king said, That's not true. It was better done than you could do it. And he answered, To tell the truth, I did not cook it, but Catskin did. Then let Catskin come up, said the king. And when she came, he said to her, who are you? I am a poor child, said she, that has lost both father and mother. How came you to be in my palace? asked he. I'm good for nothing, said she, but to be a scullion girl and have boots and shoes thrown at my head. But how did you get the ring that was in the soup? asked the king. Then she would not own that she knew anything about the ring. So the king sent her away again about her business. And after a time there was another feast, and Catskin asked the cook to let her go up and see it as before. Yes, said he, but come again in half an hour and cook the king the soup that he likes so much. She ran to her little cabin and washed herself quickly and took her dress out, which was silvery as the moon, and put it on. And when she went in looking like a king's daughter, the king went up to her and rejoiced at seeing her again. And when the dance began, he danced with her. After the dance was at an end, she managed to slip out so slyly that the king did not see where she was gone, but she sprang into her little cabin and made herself into cat skin again, and went into the kitchen to cook the soup. Whilst the cook was above stairs, she got the golden necklace and dropped it into the soup, 
Then it was brought to the king, who ate it, and it pleased him as well as before. So he sent for the cook. He was again forced to tell him that Catskin had cooked it. Catskin was brought again before the king, but she still told him that she was only fit to have boots and shoes thrown her head. But when the king had ordered a feast to be got ready for the third time, it happened just the same as before. You must be a witch, Catskin, said the cook, for you always put something into your soup so that it pleases the king better than mine. However, he let her go up as before. Then she put on her dress, which sparkled like the stars, and went into the ballroom in it. And the king danced with her again, and thought she had never looked as beautiful as she did then. So whilst he was dancing with her, he put a gold ring on her finger, without her seeing it, and ordered that the dance should be kept up a long time. When it was at an end, he would have held her fast by the hand, but she slipped away, and sprang so quickly through the crowd that he lost sight of her. She ran as fast as she could into her little cabin under the stairs, but this time she kept away too long, and stayed beyond the half hour. She had not time to take off her fine dress and threw her fur mantle over it, and in her haste she did not blacken herself with soot, but left one of her fingers white. She ran into the kitchen and cooked the king's soup, and as soon as the cook was gone, she put the golden brooch into the dish. And when the king got to the bottom, he ordered Catskin to be called once more, and saw the white finger, and the ring he had put on it whilst they were dancing. He seized her hand, and kept fast a hold of it, and when she wanted to loose herself and spring away, the fur cloak fell off a little on one side, and the starry dress sparkled underneath. He got a hold of the fur, he tore it off, her golden hair, her beautiful form was seen, and she could no longer hide herself. She washed the soot and the ashes from her face, and showed herself to be the most beautiful princess upon the face of the earth. But the king said, You are my beloved bride, we will never be parted from each other. And the wedding feast was held, and a merry day it was, as ever was heard or seen in that country, or indeed in any other. The Golden Bird A certain king had a beautiful garden, and in the garden stood a tree which bore golden apples. These apples were always counted, and about the time when they began to grow ripe, it was found that every night one of them was gone. The king became very angry at this, and ordered the gardener to keep watch all night under the tree. The gardener set his eldest son to watch. At about twelve o'clock he fell asleep, and in the morning another of the apples was missing. Then the second son was ordered to watch, and at midnight he too fell asleep, and in the morning another apple was gone. Then the third son offered to keep watch, but the gardener at first would not let him for fear some harm should come to him. However, at last he consented, and the young man laid himself under the tree to watch. As the clock struck twelve, he heard a rustling noise in the air, and a bird came flying that was of pure gold, and it was snapping at one of the apples with its beak. The gardener's son jumped up and shot an arrow at it, but the arrow did the bird no harm, only it dropped a golden feather from its tail and flew away. The golden feather was brought to the king in the morning, and all the council was called together. Everyone agreed that it was worth more than all of the wealth in the kingdom. But the king said, One feather is of no use to me. I must have the whole bird. Then the gardener's eldest son set out and thought to find the golden bird very easily. And when he had gone but a little way, he came to a wood and by the side of the wood he saw a fox sitting. So he took his bow and made ready to shoot at it. And then the fox said, Do not shoot me, for I will give you good counsel. I know what your business is, and that you want to find the golden bird. You will reach a village in the evening, and when you get there, you will see two inns opposite to each other, one of which is very pleasant and beautiful to look at. Go not in there, but rest for the night in the other, though it may appear to you to be very poor and mean. But the son thought to himself, what can such a beast know of this matter? So he shot his arrow at the fox, but he missed it, and it set up its tail above its back, 
and ran into the wood. Then he went his way, and in the evening came to the village where the two inns were, and in one of these were people singing and dancing and feasting, but the other looked very dirty and poor. I should be very silly, said he, if I went to that shabby house and left this charming place. So he went into the smart house and ate and drank at his ease and forgot the bird and his country too. Time passed on, and as the eldest son did not come back and no tidings were heard of him, the second son set out and the same thing happened to him. He met the fox who gave him the good advice, but when he came to the two inns, his eldest brother was standing at the window where the merrymaking was and called to him to come in and he could not withstand the temptation, but went in and forgot the golden bird and his country in the same manner. Time passed on again, and the youngest son too wished to set out into the wide world to seek for the golden bird. But his father would not listen to it for a long while, for he was very fond of his son and was afraid that some ill luck might happen to him also and prevent his coming back. However, at last it was agreed he should go, for he would not rest at home as he came to the wood he met the fox and heard the same good counsel, but was thankful to the fox, and did not attempt his life as his brothers had done. So the fox said, Sit upon my tail, and you will travel faster. So he sat down, and the fox began to run, and away they went, over stock and stone, so quick that their hair whistled in the wind. When they came to the village, the son followed the fox's counsel and without looking about him went to the shabby inn and rested there all night at his ease. In the morning came the fox again, and met him as he was beginning his journey, and said, Go straight forward till you come to a castle, before which lie a whole troop of soldiers fast asleep and snoring. Take no notice of them, but go into the castle and pass on and on till you come to a room where the golden bird sits in a wooden cage. Close by it stands a beautiful golden cage, but do not try to take the bird out of the shabby cage and put it into the handsome one, otherwise you will repent it. And then the fox stretched out his tail again, and the young man sat himself down, and away they went, over stock and stone, till their hair whistled in the wind. Before the castle gate all was as the fox had said, so the son went in and found the chamber where the golden bird hung in a wooden cage, and below stood the golden cage and the three golden apples that had been lost were lying close by it. He thought to himself, it will be a very droll thing to bring away such a fine bird in this shabby cage. So he opened the door and took hold of it, and put it into the golden cage. But the bird set up such a loud scream that all the soldiers awoke, and they took him prisoner, and carried him before the king. The next morning the court sat to judge him, and when all was heard, it sentenced him to die. Unless he should bring the king the golden horse, which could run as swiftly as the wind, and if he did this, he was to have the golden bird given for his own. So... He set out once more on his journey, sighing and in great despair, when on a sudden his friend, the fox, met him and said, You see now what has happened on account of your not listening to my counsel. I will still, however, tell you how to find the golden horse. If you will do as I bid you, you must go straight on till you come to the castle, where the horse stands in his stall. By his side will lie the groom, fast asleep and snoring. Take away the horse quietly, but be sure to put the old leathern saddle upon him, and not the golden one that is close by it. The sun sat down on the fox's tail, and away they went over stock and stone, till the hare whistled in their wind. All went right, and the groom lay snoring with his hand upon the golden saddle, but when the sun looked at the horse he thought it a great pity to put the leathern sandal upon it. I will give him the good one, said he. I'm sure he deserves it. As he took the golden saddle, the groom awoke and cried out so loud that all the guards ran in and took him prisoner, and in the morning he was again brought before the court to be judged and sentenced to die. But it was agreed that if he could bring thither the beautiful princess, he should live. 
and have the bird and the horse given him for his own. He went his way very sorrowful, but the old fox came and said, Why did you not listen to me? If you had, you would have carried away both the bird and the horse, yet will I once more give you counsel. Go straight on, and in the evening you will arrive at a castle. At twelve o'clock at night, the princess goes to the bathing house. Go up to her and give her a kiss, and she will let you lead her away. But take care you do not suffer her to go and take leave of her father and mother. Then the fox stretched out his tail, and so away they went, over stock and stone, till their hair whistled again. As they came to the castle, all was as the fox had said. And at twelve o'clock the young man met the princess going to the bath, and gave her a kiss, and she agreed to run away with him, but begged with many tears that he would let her take leave of her father. At first he refused, but she wept still, more and more, and fell at his feet, till at last he consented. But the moment she came to her father's house, the guards woke, and he was taken prisoner again. Then he was brought before the king, and the king said, You shall never have my daughter, unless in eight days you dig away the hill that stops the view from my window. Now this hill was so big that the whole world could not take it away, and when he had worked for seven days and had done very little, the fox came and said, Lie down and go to sleep. I will work for you. In the morning he awoke, and the hill was gone, so he went merrily to the king, and told him, now that it was removed, he must give him the princess. The king was obliged to keep his word. And away went the young man and the princess, and the fox came and said to him, We will have all three, the princess, the horse, and the bird. Ah, said the young man, that would be a great thing, but how can you contrive it? If you will only listen, said the fox, it can be done. When you come to the king and he asks for the beautiful princess, he must say, here she is, then he will be very joyful, and you will mount the golden horse that they give to you, and put out your hand to take leave of them, but shake hands with the princess last, lift her quickly onto the horse behind you, clap your spurs to his side, and gallop away as fast as you can. All went right, then the fox said, when you come to the castle where the bird is, I will stay with the princess at the door. You will ride in and speak to the king, and when he sees that is the right horse, he will bring out the bird. But you must sit still, and say that you want to look at it, to see whether it is the true golden bird, and when you get it into your hand, ride away. This too happened as the fox said. They carried off the bird. The princess mounted again, and they rode on to a great wood. Then the fox came and said, Pray kill me cut off my head and my feet, but the young man refused to do it, so the fox said, I will at any rate give you good counsel, beware of two things, ransom no one from the gallows, and sit down by the side of the river, and away he went. Well, thought the young man, it's no hard matter to keep that advice. He rode on with the princess, till at last he came to the village where he had left his two brothers, and there he heard a great noise and uproar. And when he asked what was the matter, the people said, Two men are going to be hanged. As he came nearer, he saw that the two men were his brothers, who had turned robbers. So he said, Cannot they in any way be saved? But the people said, No, unless he would bestow all his money upon the rascals and buy their liberty. Then he did not stay to think about the matter, but paid what was asked, and his brothers were given up and went on with him towards their home. And as they came to the wood where the fox first met them, it was so cool and pleasant that the two brothers said, Let us sit down by the side of the river, and rest a while to eat and drink. So he said yes, and forgot the fox's counsel, and sat down by the side of the river, and while he suspected nothing, they came behind and threw him down the bank, and took the princess the horse, and the bird, and went home to the king their master and said, All this have we won by our labor. Then there was great rejoicing made, but the horse would not eat, the bird would not sing, and the princess wept. 
The youngest son fell to the bottom of the river's bed. Luckily it was nearly dry, but his bones were almost broken and the bank was so steep that he could not find a way to get out and the old fox came once more and scolded him for not following his advice. Otherwise no evil would have befallen him. Yet, said he, I cannot leave you here. Lay hold of my tail and hold fast. Then he pulled him out of the river, and said to him as he got upon the bank, Your brothers have set watch to kill you, if they find you in the kingdom. So he dressed himself as a poor man, and came secretly to the king's court, and was scarcely within the doors when the horse began to eat, the bird began to sing, and the princess left off weeping. Then he went to the king and told him all his brother's roguery. They were seized and punished, and he had the princess given to him again, and after the king's death he was heir to his kingdom. A long while after he went to walk one day in the wood, and the old fox met him, and besought him with tears in his eyes to kill him, and cut off his head and feet, and at last he did so, and in a moment the fox was changed into a man, and turned out to be the brother of the princess, who had been lost a great many, many years. That was The Golden Bird from Fairy Tales by the Brothers Grimm.